Hello, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. I am your host, Francie, and today I'm joined by Kyle. And Kyle, I want to pick your brain because I'm pretty curious about what people should be expecting as networks open up. So we're talking about NACs, we're talking about CCS, we're going to talk about Chatmo a little bit because what we really know is the CCS network for public charging. The Tesla charging has been its own thing, and now we're melding the worlds of CCS and NACs, and I don't really know where Chatmo fits in, but there are things that I think we need to di- differentiate between to better understand. Um, so welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me again today, Kyle. How are you doing this evening? Good. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I am loving the uh, deciduous forest that just exists all over these neighborhoods. It's actually really nice. It grows over onto the sidewalks and adds a lot of shade. So for those folks in Atlanta, you seem pretty lucky. It's pretty nice here. But um, yeah, Kyle, so I know in the past, something that I think about is how um, Tesla kind of partnered with the public charging network EVgo to allow Teslas to charge on their network. And when you think about that, and then you see maybe new CCS dual NAX charging um, and like how they might be similar, but in fact, there is quite a difference between that original partnership and work that Tesla did with EVgo Uh, And then now what we're going to see as networks are actually incorporating NACS connectors. So that difference is quite distinct because you don't want to show up at a charger at which you actually cannot charge depending on your Tesla. So it's not only have to do with the charging stations and what they're offering, but also which Teslas you're driving. So I want you to help me paint a picture of one, how can we approach this? And also a bit of the backstory to how this has changed over time throughout the uh, history of the EV evolution of the EV charging networks. Well, that's a lot of questions already right off the bat. So yep, to set the stage, um, I can't remember what year it was that EVgo and Tesla worked together, but uh, those who watch this podcast are longtime EV drivers and experts, of course. So um, maybe if you're not, if you just happen to tune in, uh, there's basically three main charging ports in the U.S. right now. There's the Chatamo port, which really only the Nissan Leaf uses, and Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. Uh, that's kind of dead. Then there's also CCS, which pretty much every electric vehicle uses, except for Tesla. And because the Tesla supercharger network is so much more reliable than the other public charging networks that use CCS, automakers started to want to have access to the Tesla network, their better locations, more available chargers, they're maintained better than the public networks. We all know this, nothing new here. But what happened was um, te- they needed to start putting these Tesla ports on their vehicles like Ford, GM, uh, Mercedes, et cetera, et cetera, in able to interface with the Tesla supercharger network. Now that the country, the U.S. as a whole, has pretty much gone and decided that the North American charging standard is the standard in the U.S., um, we're starting to see public chargers have retrofits. We did a whole podcast on this a couple podcasts ago or last podcast. We did a whole podcast on this saying that they're just starting to roll out now public chargers, non-Tesla superchargers, with the Tesla port on them. but. Actually, two or three or four or five years ago, EVgo was ahead of everyone and put Tesla connectors on their chargers. And um, they actually operated differently than the public ones that we're seeing now. So here's the break it down pretty simply for you. Teslas have always had an adapter available to them, at least with the launch of Model S, to use Chatamo charging stations because the Tesla communication is very similar to Chatamo, actually, in the way that it communicates with superchargers. And so it was pretty easy for Tesla to offer a Chatamo to Tesla adapter. You could bring it to Nissan dealerships and charge fast or other public chargers, and it would be very common to have a Chatamo fast charger. And then you know, early on, 2013, 14, 15, CCS started to become more popular. And so those stations started to get retrofitted with one side of them being Chatamo, the other side of them being CCS. 
That's still quite common to find today in the U.S. And only it was maybe 2021, was it, where Tesla started to enable their cars to charge on the CCS public charging networks with an adapter that Tesla sold natively. And this is a, um, you know, kind of a confusing situation for owners because if you have an older Tesla before 2021, uh, without getting a service center retrofit, a physical service center retrofit, you can't use that CCS adapter to charge your car. It actually requires a different charge port with a different ECU to handle the CCS communications. And that's where things get really complicated when we're talking about the rollout of North American charging standard. We mentioned that the EVgo chargers used Chatamo adapters with an elongated cable. Teslas can do that natively since the early Model S. That's not hard. It's also speed limited to only 125 amps or roughly 50 kilowatts or less. Um, so it was a really low power uh, you know, solution. But if you were in a Tesla and you needed to charge and you didn't have your Chatamo adapter handy, it was built into the charger and you could do it. It was a really cool early thing that EVgo did, actually. I really, really liked that one. Now that Nax is uh, arriving to public chargers, they'll be able to handle full speed charging, 500 plus amps, uh, and we'll probably see them close to 600, 700 amps with new technology coming down the line very soon. Only brand new Teslas will be able to interface with those that have the CCS adapter or CCS capability enabled in the Tesla. So, Francie, isn't that wild that, like, as an example, I could take my 2019 Model 3 take it to a version three supercharger, charge just fine, full 250 kilowatts, plug and charge, no issue. But I could also go by ChargePoint's headquarters where they have a North American charging standard, looks the same as the supercharger handle, plug it into my car and it would say, I, I don't know what to do with this, unable to charge. Isn't that wild? It is pretty wild. It doesn't seem super user-friendly and it, like it will take uh, an effort from... Tesla and probably the charge point operators, whether it's like a site host or a, a larger network to try to educate folks. Because if we're thinking about that customer experience, that is obviously top of mind in the EV charging world, of course, then you have to think that customers might not have all the information that they need, but they know to show up at a charger at least. So what are the pieces that are missing between making sure that folks know what they're EV is capable of um, and like where that cutoff is maybe, and then also what chargers are going to work for them. So do you think there is going to be like an approach that is educational or informative? Because when uh, my dad and I traded in his like model three for his uh, model S, there really wasn't much of a education session um, on much of anything. I know that he had to watch some videos, but a lot of folks won't watch it um, and they will just kind of take the car and go. So I do worry about the lack of information that will be shared to make sure folks know where they can charge on public networks. Yeah. So I think the bit, I totally agree. And I, I, yes, there's going to be education, but we, even with all the education, everyone's been trying for years and years, you're not going to reach everyone. There's going to be a bunch of drivers who just have these, they buy a used Model 3 from 2018, 2019, 2020, as an example. And, you know, they, they're they dead on charge and they saw in PlugShare that this one has the, the North American charging standard, the Tesla connector, same as their car, and they're going to roll in dead and it's not going to work. We know that's going to happen. But if you're listening to this podcast, you can have it not happen to you. What you need to do is go into your Tesla and in the screen, you go to settings, you go to software, and inside the software menu, there's something that will say additional vehicle information. You click that, it's like a little eye next to it, and it will show you CCS capability. It will tell you enabled or not installed or not enabled. And it'll be pretty clear as to the messaging as to whether you have CCS capability or you don't. Let's okay. say it says you do. Okay, that would be like any new Tesla that you buy today. Well, you can either charge on any CCS charger with the adapter, which you can buy for like 175 bucks from Tesla's shop, or you can go to public chargers that have the Tesla connector on them, other than the supercharger network, that will charge every Tesla. But you could go to like a charge point, you know, DC fast charger that has 
built-in North American charging standard, or you could go to one of those X charge units or others that we know are adding the North American charging standard, like ABB and BTC and, and so on and so forth. Everyone's adding the connector to their, their products. And, um, so that's easy. If it says it's installed, then you can go anywhere. You can charge on anything. You can use the adapter. You can use a supercharger. You can use the Chatamo adapter. You can charge on everything. It's magical. It's really cool. However, if it says you don't have CCS capability, that car cannot charge with a CCS adapter or with a North American charging standard public charger. It sounds like Tesla superchargers will still be able to charge them. We know version three will. It sounds likely that version four will be able to charge them as well. But to use any public station other than a Chatamo adapter station or a Chatamo station with a very expensive adapter that I don't even think they sell anymore, um, you will have to actually schedule service at Tesla and retrofit the charge port. Now, there are aftermarket solutions to charge port retrofits. They're readily available online. We've heard great success. Uh, and I don't think it's anything too crazy if you're slightly electrically or mechanically inclined. However, um, Tesla does offer these retrofits as a service for Model S and Model X, the early cars. And I believe starting sometime around now, Model 3 and early Model Y can also get the retrofits from Tesla. Um, I have not done the aftermarket swap on my Model 3. I've been toying with the idea. I think I may have actually even bought everything I need. I just haven't done it. But I was figured I would wait until Tesla does it just to make a video to see how that process is like. So we'll follow along there. I think if you have an older Tesla, it's going to be worth the couple hundred bucks uh, to, to have a service technician come out, swap the charge port ECU, swap the charge port, and um, then get access to so many more chargers out there. For example, here in the Colorado area, we have way more CCS public chargers than we do superchargers. And so it's actually easier to get around in the mountain area here with a non-Tesla than it is a Tesla vehicle. So it's great when you have a Tesla, you have access to everything. You can use superchargers, public chargers, NAX public chargers, Chatamo adapters. And so it's going to be worth it to get that retrofit. But if you're buying a used Tesla, keep that in mind that you may not immediately be able to use every charger if it's an older car. So you said that someone who might be uh, electrically or, me or mechanically uh, inclined, that they would be able to kind of do this on their own. Um, but didn't we see with... Um, uh, Winston on our recent podcast that he retrofitted for CCS, but he wasn't able to charge. But that was on the supercharger network, the Tesla network. But he would be able to charge on EVgo or EA or charge yes. point. So he had to do his car was salvaged, which meant he was he had no access to the supercharger network because Tesla blocked that car. Um, but because he swapped the charge port, he can use CCS chargers anywhere. And so that's a you know, edge case more or less for some people, but yeah, highly recommend anyone who has a Tesla without the CCS capability, retrofit that car. You're going to unlock so many possibilities, do it aftermarket, do it with Tesla. It doesn't matter to me as long as you're safe and competent at doing that job. It's not a dangerous job. It's not a hard job. And, um, yeah, but I think there's going to need to be some education. And that's what I want to hear in the comments is how do you explain to people who don't understand communications because NAX uses ISO 15118, basically CCS communications and Tesla superchargers use CAN communications, totally different, same plug. How do you explain that to people that don't like aren't nerds? I don't know. And I think it's going to be messy. Yeah, it probably is going to be a little bit messy. And I wonder, is that the only option that folks have is to retrofit their Tesla or does Tesla have an option like that they could do to make this easier for folks on their network. No. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no other way, really. I mean, in theory, the chargers could be adapted to communicate through the Tesla communications, but it, there's no spec for it. So it would be like an aftermarket weird hack, um, because if you just read through how Tesla's communicating ISO 15118 and how it's going through the Society of Automotive Engineers to become J30 something, something, I forget exactly what it is. 3604, is it, Dominic? Do you know? Whatever NAX is becoming? Something like that. 3000 something. Um, you have to follow that spec, which is going to use ISO 15118 communications, which means it can't communicate through the CAN communication, which means you have to retrofit the Tesla. Can't CAN 
Max PCS, a lot of things flying around that makes it inherently confusing uh, in terms of charging. And I do think that this will take, you know, just more communication, whether it's from out of spec or from uh, the automakers and the charge point operators to clarify this with consumers. But it is definitely an essential topic. And hopefully we can have like a, a video up on the guide channel to show folks really how to look into those steps that you said and go through the process and just further explore this topic because it seems, I think at the surface level, if you're not really techie and not dive into the gritty, nitty gritty like us, which some EV owners don't, they just want a car that works, they get it, they plug it in like they plug in their phone and they drive it around. But if they're going, to, if they're not, if they can't understand, then how can it be communicated in an effective way? So I think this is an interesting part of things. It's um, a bit, you know, less on the technical side and more on the customer information sharing side, but definitely important to address. And yeah, the nice um, the standard is called J3400. So sorry for getting that one wrong. But it's, so J3400 is NAX turned okay. into a standard. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kyle, for that corrections corner. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, so let us know in the comments how you would navigate explaining that to folks or if it has been explained to you in an effective way as well. I think that there you know, are some minds that can are really good at educating and teaching a concept that might be complicated and breaking it down into really understandable, digestible bits and pieces. I know that we can dive into the details here on out of spec, but it is important that if we're going to have more and more people come over to the EV side of things that it's very accessible and, you know, not only from like, you know, having the car accessibility, we see that in a lot, but across the board with the EV space. So thanks, Kyle, for coming on and kind of exploring the challenges that are facing this. Nax is not as upfront and simple as we think it is. You don't just adapt to Nax. Um, and we're just going to see more and more facets of this and talk about this and how if it's really going to be adopted widespread in the, I think, definitely long term, we're not even seeing automakers aside from Tesla, you know, use NAX yet, but then also planning ahead to see the challenges that will be upcoming on the network. Um, and Kyle did mention that, you know, ChargePoint and um, some other operators have these dual NAX CCS, but there aren't that many yet. So, uh, but as we see those rolling out onto the networks, this will become a bigger and bigger issue. So hopefully we can get ahead of it as a community. Yeah, because what you're going to see is you're going to see like, a Tesla owner like me in my Model 3 roll up to a charger and say, it doesn't charge my car. The charger is broken. But no, it's just your car isn't CCS enabled to handle the communications of the new cable uh, and the new right. standard. So it's going to be interesting. I'm going to ask, ask, what am I trying to say? I'm going to ask Max to make a video on this for the out of spec guide channel, which is like the ABCs of EVs. And mm -hmm. he will be, do a much better job than I do of breaking it down into something digestible that someone who doesn't understand nerd stuff will totally get. But um, I think for the audience of this podcast, we can get nerdy and holy smokes, you're going to have to help a lot of people at Chargers get through this. And um, yeah, it's going to be a little bit messy, I think, over the next few years until the early fleet of Teslas are all adapted. It'll take a village, as most things do. Um, so thanks, Kyle, for going through that with me. Like I said, it's an interesting topic. It's, you know, a world of challenges in the EV space, and this is just one of them. So hopefully Max can make, yeah, like you said, a useful video and break it down for us. So thanks, everyone. Let us know your thoughts below on the other challenges that we might see as we transfer over um, what is certainly not going to be the smoothest transition, if it is a full transition. I I don't think it's going to be one or the other personally, um, at least in the foreseeable future. But yeah, thanks for tuning in to the Out of Spec podcast. Of course, email us for topics that you find interesting at podcast at outofspecstudios.com. You can tweet at us. I'm hey underscore Francie. You probably know where Kyle is. And in general, thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We love hosting these conversations and we think that they're really important. So of course, we want to cover what's most relevant to you. So let us know what you thought about this conversation as well. We will see you next time on the Out of Spec podcast. Bye, y'all.